Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. This one written by Danny. Usual Danny. Usually Danny features over on my other channel, Brain Blaze. But today he's written in the unspeakable Baker Street bank robbery, which is a hell of a mouthful. What the blazes was stolen, Sherlock. <laughs> no offense, Danny, but that title is definitely going to be different when it gets to U uh, YouTube because that is confusing. <laughs> and it's clever, but it's confusing. Uh, what happens here is uh, we're going to decode a mystery, which I guess is about a robbery. Thanks, th thanks, Danny, for writing it. I've never read it before. Let's dive in. <laughs> British newspapers were crammed full of the usual cheerful headlines during the weekend spanning the 10th to 12th of January 1971. Okay then. Yeah, <laughs> newspapers always just full of good news, because good news, famous for selling. <laughs> The IRA tarred and feathered four men in what was deemed to be a punishment attack. An unmanned Soviet lunar probe reached the moon but promptly blew up in defeat. French fashion designer Coco Chanel died at the age of 87, whilst the following Monday a 200 vehicle pileup on the M6 motorway would claim 10 lives. 200 vehicles? What the hell? Is that even possible? I guess it could be just like super busy, but uh, you've got to keep a distance, right? You've got to keep that like two seconds between you and the car in front of you, because otherwise... Were 200 people not doing that? Good lord. But there was one other newsworthy event notably missing from the front pages of the press. On the night of the 11th of September 1971, never forget, one of the most mysterious and indeed ridiculous raids was carried out at Lloyd's Bank on Baker Street in London. The Baker Street bank robbery wasn't technically a robbery at all, as no force or threats of violence against other parties were required. If we're being pedantic and crikey, I think we are, it was more of a burglary. But what a burglary it was. Yeah, there's a really big very big important difference between i assume this is similar in us law but in uk law the difference between a burglary and a robbery is marked because in a burglary burglary i think by the definition of it is just entering a place where you're not supposed to be so trespass which isn't even a crime it's just a civil offense but then uh doing something you're not supposed to like if you nick something or if you even if you break something or do graffiti or whatever that's technically burglary Whereas robbery is like, put your hands up! <laughs> and that is a way more, way more serious crime. It appeared for a while as if the thieves had got away with a massive haul right under the noses of the police, while some of the members of the gang, maybe even the ringleader himself, were never convicted, identified, or even looked for. <laughs> you don't lazy police. The gang walked off with loot worth up to three million pounds, or 36 million pounds in today's money. The vast <laughs> inflation's devastating, isn't it? This was only the 1970s. <laughs> I mean, that was a long time ago. It was well before I was born. But still, the fact that money's lost over a tenth of its value is like, oh, God, being a millionaire is not what it used to be. Because three million pounds, you'd be like, oh, yeah, okay. I mean, it's a lot of money, don't get me wrong. But it's not like, like, it's not like 36 million pounds, is it? The vast majority of which was never recovered. And yet, the thieves never even tried to crack open the bank's safe. They were only interested in taking the booty found in hundreds of deposit boxes which the bank kept secured in the vault on behalf of the wealthier customers in need of a good hiding spot. I have a, I have, I have a safety deposit box. <laughs> Should I talk about this? Because it's like, okay, well, you're just inviting trouble, aren't you? Well, yes. I, I mean, it's mostly for, like, old documents and sh like that you don't want if your house burns down you know that there's just one copy of and i have to say getting this safety deposit box i assumed that it's not going to be at all like the movies that you're going to go in it's going to be some dingy room that's sort of not very well protected and it's just like out the back of the bank and i have to say it was like the most movie like ex there are sliding glass doors there are huge like big vaults that you walk through there's a woman with two keys one for you one for her who goes in and opens this thing and it's like holy it's just like in the movies for real skis? And then there's these little rooms where you go into and you open your safety deposit box and like in in privacy and they don't let you in if there's anyone else like in the in the vault area. It's legit. I have to say it's really and it's not even expensive. I thought it was just for like rich people, but I think I pay like 200 pounds a year or something equivalent for that. It's pretty awesome to be honest. <laughs> It's like, I just feel like such a spy going, I expect to open up the box and like there'd be six passports in there. And instead it's just like, you know, my house's deed or whatever. Yeah, like, okay. <laughs> but you still feel so cool. And it's possible they were after one deposit box in particular, a box containing a photograph of a member of the royal family which had the potential to send shockwaves throughout the UK if it was ever made public. A deposit box which was possibly worth more than the rest of the contents of the bank vault combined. 
But why was the press initially so shy to report on these major news events, and had they been officially silenced to prevent the leaking of an earth-shattering scandal? I believe there used to be, I don't think it was the law, but it was generally accepted that the polit that the, the press didn't report on like scandals of the royal family, just out of like a dignity thing. Obviously that's well out of the window. <laughs> And I don't want to, like, name a specific paper, but let's just say maybe the news of the world. I, I, I don't know if they actually had anything to do with that, but it's, they seem like the sort of paper that, in my opinion, would be the sort of newspaper that was like, no, nah, we're going to report on the royal family and all their crazy <laughs> And everyone else was like, okay, <laughs> let's go! Why did the police make a string of baffling decisions during the investigation before seemingly losing all interest in catching the other perpetrators? And were the gang just pawns in a secret operation overseen by MI5 in a bid to ensure the retrieval of material that should never be seen by the public? Well, it's all Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's fault, really. He was the one who penned the, 19, the 1891 Sherlock Holmes story, The Red-Headed League, which apparently inspired the whole thing. During the course of the short story, a gang of crooks attempt to tunnel through the floor of a bank from a neighboring shop, but the plan is foiled when they poke their heads up from the hole in the bank floor, only to find clever old Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson already waiting for them with PC plot. 38-year-old Anthony Tony Gavin was a big fan of Sherlock Holmes. Who isn't? Sherlock Holmes is great. The small-time crook hailed from North London and was supposedly the ringleader of the Baker Street heist, or at least he's the only person in the frame that we ever got to know about. A former physical training instructor for the army, Tony was described as a forceful personality who had the propensity to be physically threatening. Wait, he sounds like, you know, uh, the, what was it? Former physical training instructor for the army. He sounds like a drill sergeant, doesn't he? Like, you get down on the ground, recruit! You know, like from movies and shit. But whilst he was certainly known to have criminal connections, Tony had up until now only been involved in reasonably small fry stuff. The idea of copying the plot from an old Sherlock Holmes story, albeit a failed plot from an old Sherlock Holmes story, was certainly a massive leap from Tony's usual dodgy activity. But Tony may have wisely come to the conclusion that as Sherlock Holmes was a fictional character, he and his gang would only have the bumbling British bobbies to contend with in real life, and they were unlikely to be as sharp-witted as the world's greatest detective. Yeah, the world's greatest detective who's also fictional, so knows the end. <laughs> he was certainly right about that part. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Sir Arthur Conan Doyle has written this like extremely elaborate crime, and in the real world, there's not anyone to help solve it. However, when you hear of the exact location that Tony had decided upon as a suitable target for his own bank vault tunneling operation, you begin to wonder just how seriously he was taking the whole thing. If I'm not mistaken, I believe there's a bit of a story. I'm sure Danny's going to tell it to us, but I just want to prove how smart I am by telling it to you ahead of time. <laughs> I don't know why I do this. But I think Lloyd's, that, that is at 23B Baker Street. Is that Sherlock Holmes' address, 23B Baker Street? Whatever it is, whatever Sherlock Holmes' address is, address is, I think for a very long time that Lloyd's Bank was it, and they would actually have someone answering Sherlock Holmes' fan mail. Apparently some people did think he was real. And then the Sherlock Holmes Museum opens, like, nearby, and they managed to get the address assigned to them, even though Lloyd's have been doing this great job of replying to all of these letters for ages. And it seemed like a bit rubbish, like, that they'd just be able to take that, although... Especially as it's like, it's not like a, you know, a free museum. It's like just a private company that managed to get this. And it's like, okay, why? Why do you get that priority? Lloyds have been doing a great job. Anyway, moving on. Of all the banks in London that he could have chosen, he decided that the perfect candidate was a branch of Lloyd's located on Baker Street, the very same street in which his fictional detective had lived. It almost sounds as if the whole operation was just some kind of live-action tribute to classic literature, and I expect that he briefly toyed with the idea of getting all the gang members to dress up in tweed coats and deerstalker hats while carrying out the raid, pausing only to inject themselves with cocaine every now and then. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, legend. But this could have been an entirely coincidental link to the original inspiration behind the heist. Lloyd's Bank on Baker Street was reportedly home to the most impregnable bank vault in the UK, complete with steel reinforced concrete walls and bomb proof doors that weighed over five tons. Yeah, there's no way that those, the doors, like I was saying about my safety deposit box, there's no way that those doors are not bomb proof that go into that room. They are, they're literally this thick, they're a meter thick, and they roll out on these huge things. There's no shot that you could. I mean, I say this, someone will break in. I'm like, do you have insurance for the contents? And they're like, no. Like, because we don't know what's in there. And also, no one, I mean, it's up, it's up to a limit. And they're like, but no one ever breaks in. There's never been a robbery in like the hundred something years that the bank's been open or whatever. You know, okay, I guess I'll trust you. 
That might be why it attracted the interest of uber-rich and powerful customers who were looking to rent deposit boxes in which they could confidently stash their valuables and, seek and their secrets, legal or otherwise. Lloyd's Bank on Baker Street sounded like the safest place in the country to rent such a deposit box, and so they were bound by to be all manner of weird and wonderful trinkets stored in those little treasure chests. But how impregnable was the vault from below? This was about to be put to the test as Tony began assembling a crack team of similarly small-time crooks to tunnel through the floor of a neighboring property and come up smiling in the vault of Lloyd's Bank. Who's... The people were really not thinking about this back in the day. It's like, yes, we built this excellent vault. No one could ever get in from below. <laughs> There's earth down there. <laughs> I am too smart. I am too smart. S-M-R-T. I mean, S-M-A-R-R-T. Really? Like, really? They would have to do a fair bit of tunneling as they couldn't get access to the property right next door, which was occupied by a branch of the fast food chain, Chicken Inn. With all the will in the world, it would have been difficult to secretly start digging a giant hole in the floor of Chicken Inn without risking attracting the attention of all the customers who were just trying to enjoy a Mexicano wrap in peace. Wait, what does Chicken Inn sell? Why would they have a Mexicano wrap? <laughs> I just assume they're selling delicious fried chicken. But they had better luck when they moved just one step further down the street and came across an old leather goods shop by the name of Le Sac, which had recently closed for business, leaving the property up for lease. It's always been reported that it was just a jolly slice of good fortune for the gang, but I can't help feeling that this was surely factored into Tony Gavin's original decision to target Lloyd's Bank in Baker Street. It maybe wasn't just about a particular obsession with Sherlock Holmes, it was more to do with the fact that a property had just become a for use, which was only two doors down from the bank. Tony hooked up with a 64-year-old contract contact by the name of Benjamin Wolf, who was known for selling antiques, which may have allegedly fallen off the back of a lorry. <laughs> do you have this? I, I know lorry is a British word for like truck Americans. Do you have this saying like fall off the back of the lorry? Like someone's like, where'd you get that? Fell off the back of the lorry. It means they stole it. <laughs> it means you're buying stolen goods. It was Benjamin who leased the building for £10,000 on the pretext that he was preparing to open another dodgy antiques shop. But far more, really, the guy who's like off the back of a lorry antiques has a shop? I assume he just sells it in like a market or like some dodgy corner of his house. But far more significantly than the sale of a few mahogany sideboards, Tony's big tunnel now at a starting point. Tony's next recruit was a guy called Reg Tucker, a second-hand car salesman who was an unusual candidate to join the gang as he had no criminal history other than being a second-hand car salesman. Yeah, like, famously dodgy. Tony got Reg to open a new bank account in the Baker Street branch of Lloyd's under a fake name, after which Reg made polite inquiries about the possibility of renting his own safety deposit box. <laughs> I've opened many bank accounts. You can't just go in there and be like, Hello, John Smith here, opening an account. They're like, Okay, I need like six forms of ID, sir, and I need you to sign all these things. And <laughs> then we're going to look you up and make sure you're all right. <laughs> back in the day, back in the 70s, they were like, Welcome! <laughs> Do you have any terrorist funds? <laughs> The bank staff probably assumed that Reg was something of a fl high flyer as he turns up dressed as if he was an aristocrat while wielding an umbrella and speaking in a super posh BBC English. And he seemed very keen to keep a close eye on the contents of his newly rented safety deposit box. Over the course of the next two months, Reg was reported to have visited the bank no less than 13 times to spend some quality time alone in the vault with his box. I would have thought that leaving a customer alone in the bank vault for any length of time might be considered a slight security risk, but apparently it was common practice back in the 1970s to allow customers customers a bit of privacy when they were visiting their deposit box. Wait, yes, uh, this is exactly what happens. The, the woman goes in, she puts her key in, she unlocks her lock, and then she leaves and goes back to the reception area, and then I'm just left in there with all the boxes and my box, and then you take it to a, a, an even more private little area. <laughs> it seems very normal, because what's in your deposit box is like private, right? And during these brief windows of solitude, Reg kept himself very busy. Not with his deposit box, obviously, he probably just kept a sock puppies in there. No, 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 Reg got busy mentally mapping out the dimensions of the vault, noting the exact locations of the cabinet and the furniture. And that umbrella he was wielding wasn't just for show, he used it alongside the span of his arms to measure out every nook and cranny of the vault. During the course of those 13 visits over two months, Reg Stucker had mapped out the precise position of where exactly the tunnelers needed to emerge. Tony's big tunnel now had a finishing point. Several other recruits had joined the gang by this stage, although some of them were never identified. This is risky business. This feels more like a casual... Is this a casual criminal, is Danny? Well, I, I guess it's because it's a mystery. There's more mystery to this than we find on a casual criminal. Also, robberies do not very well on casual criminals because everyone wants to see the blood spill. But, um... 
Okay, but we talk about on Casual Criminalist all the time how the crimin the more people you involve in your crimes, the more likely you are to get caught. It's like do it. It's better to do it slowly and uh, with less people than it is to do it quick with more people. It's just crime 101. We do know that Tony hired a lookout and a burglar alarm expert, while another second-hand car salesman by the name of Thomas Stevens was in charge of sourcing the tools needed for the job. When this guy looks like a criminal gang, he doesn't go to the underworld, he just goes down to like Tony's dodgy dealership and it's like, Hey, who wants to do some crime? <laughs> Thomas made a pretty good job of this, getting his hands on a 100 ton jack, a thermal lance, and a healthy stack of good old gel, gel ignite. I'm guessing that's some sort of explosive. By the beginning, I'm gonna look that up. Gel ignite. Look up. Gel ignite, a high explosive made from a gel of nitroglycerin and nitrocellulose in a base of wood pump. That sounds exactly like um, dynamite. It's blasting gelatin, or simply jelly. <laughs> By the beginning of August 1971, this unlikely bunch of characters were all ready to start getting their hands dirty and tackling the biggest job of their lives. The plan was to dig down five feet uh, from the starting point in the old leather goods shop now leased by Benjamin Wolf, create a 40 foot long tunnel which ran right under the branch of Chicken Inn and then start tunneling back upwards when their noses sniffed money above. Five feet down? That's not very deep. I would assume you've got to go down at least 10 feet, 20 feet, because there's going to be like, I don't know, foundations and supporting things and like you're just like digging through and you're like, oh, we're in the chicken in basement. We're in the storage room of the chicken in, for fuck's sake. There's Peter in here and he's been the freezer, stocking things in the freezer. But even after they had tunneled back up through the earth toward the vault, they would still have another three feet of reinforced concrete to get through before they could emerge into the vault and start breaking open all the deposit boxes. Well, at least they thought about putting three feet of reinforced concrete out there. That sounds like a pretty good idea. This quite ambitious feat of engineering just took, took over just a month to complete, which is even more impressive when you take into account that they worked only at weekends when the bank was closed to minimize any suspicion that might have arisen from strange underground noises. It was reported that staff working at Chicken Inn did indeed hear occasional strange noises coming from beneath their feet and would later hear suspicious noises coming from the bank itself on the actual day of the burglary, but this was never reported to police. Yeah, because you're in a busy city, you'll be like, I don't know what that is. It's probably just like an underground train rolling by or like something. You just ignore it. You're not going to call the police because like, I heard a weird sound beneath my feet. You'd never even think you'd just be like, it's a weird sound. I don't know what's going down. Maybe it's piping. Maybe there's like a rattling around pipe down there. You wouldn't call the police. Another little slice of good fortune for the gang, or perhaps it was just very good planning, was the roadworks in the local area, which had been regularly setting off the bank's trembler alarms installed in the vault. The Lloyd staff had soon grown tired of the constant false alarms being generated every half hour or so, so they liaised with the roadworkers and agreed to turn off the trembler alarms whenever the roadwork crew was poised to undertake another bout of intense digging. This worked out pretty handy for the gang, who were getting tipped off about the exact timings from a member of a local security company so they could synchronize their own bouts of intense digging with the road workers and avoid any risk of activating the trembler alarm wow like this guy's gang of people how many people are involved in this crime this seems like oh yeah we got the guy at the road works we got this guy we got the guy from the car dealership lots and lots and lots and lots how are none of you getting caught didn't they say like hardly anyone gets caught for this it was still hard and perilous work the forming of the tunnel generated close to eighteen thousand pounds of debris which had to be shifted back toward the shop and dumped around the back <laughs> Is that 18,000 pounds? Tony Gavin reckons that he lost two stone during the digging of the tunnel, and of course the danger was, if the tunnel should suddenly collapse on the gang, it was going to be tricky informing the paramedics that a gang of robbers had fallen into a spot of bother during an attempted bank heist. But on Friday the 10th of September, the goal was almost in sight. The tunnel was nearly complete, and the gang just now had to get through three feet of reinforced concrete before they finally hit the bank vault. The tools guy, Thomas Stevens, whipped out the 100-ton hydraulic jack in an attempt to force a big hole in the concrete above, but the gang found that the pressure of the jack was actually just pushing the bottom of their tunnel downwards into a well deep below instead of raising the floor of the vault. No worries, Thomas had a plan B. He whipped out the thermal lance in an attempt to cut right through the floor, but this gen just ended up creating toxic fumes within the tiny confined space and the gang were now in danger of passing out. But no worries, Thomas had a plan C. This is a well-prepared dude. He whipped out the gel, gel ignite, drilled a few holes in the concrete floor, and then stuffed the holes with gel ignite, coordinating the subsequent explosion with the noise of the roadworks outside. I feel like they just need to turn the... They've got that trembler alarm. How about you just turn it down a little rather than turn it off? Because explosions underneath the bank vaults are going to register a little bit higher than the dudes digging the road outside. 
This did the trick nicely, creating a 12-inch hole in the floor of the vault. And you have to give Thomas Stevens some credit here for being remarkably well prepared, perhaps even curiously well prepared for a second-hand car salesman. It seems almost a shame that the Jell Ignite worked, as it would have been interesting to see what Thomas had in mind for plans D, E, and F. But none of that mattered. They were now in. And as Lloyds Bank closed its doors for business on Friday evening, the gang knew that they had until the early hours of Monday morning to get busy smashing up those deposit boxes and taking as much as they could back through the tunnel to the shop. The lookout was posted on a nearby roof, and he kept close communications via walkie-talkies with the rest of the gang lurking in the tunnel. I'm kind of surprised that in a way that they only got the modern equivalent of 36 million pounds. Because they're in a giant, famous Lloyds Bank, right? In their safety deposit boxes. For like, an entire weekend. I feel like there's got to be more than that amount of money in there. Like, in this one, I've, I keep bringing up this one I have, but it's, it's my only reference point other than spy movies. It's like, there's a lot of boxes in there, and I'm sure there's a lot of, like, gold and and jewellery in those boxes. But here's where the gang made what should have been a disastrous slip-up. They often fraught conversations taking place on those walkie-talkies at a slightly bigger audience than they intended. I'm like, yeah, imme that's immediately what springs to mind. Walkie-talkies are unsecure. Like, you can tune in to other people's walkie-talkie frequencies if you've got a walkie-talkie. <laughs> Robert Rowlands was an amateur CB radio ham who lived just around the corner on Wimpole Street. On that same Friday night, he settled down with a cup of Bovril and an Ian Fleming novel and decided that he fancied tuning in to Radio Luxembourg. But after he fiddled around with the radio dial, he was surprised to discover that he wasn't going to be chilling out to the hip sounds of Mungo Jerry or the Moody Blues tonight. Instead, he was picking up what appeared to be a tense conversation between a nervous lookout and a gang of thieves. At first, Robert wondered if the local cigarette shop was being burgled, but as he listened in further, he began to realize that he was eavesdropping on a job that was much, much bigger in scope. So, Robert did what any good citizen would do. He phoned up the local police station and informed them that it accidentally tuned in to a suspected underground bank robbery. Sadly, the police didn't seem to be remotely bothered about such a trivial issue. It's not entirely clear if they thought Robert was just a prank caller or whether they had more important things to deal with. Things can get pretty rough in London on a late Friday night. But whatever the reason, they were largely dismissive of Robert's call and just advised him to record the conversation before bothering them again with any trifling matters. At this point, some of us might have just sacked the whole thing off and gone back to trying to find Radio Luxembourg whilst muttering about the state of the British police force and the country in general. I would not be listening in on that. We're fascinated. And if I had any recording equipment, I'd be recording it. Why not? It's a whole lot more interesting than Radio Luxembourg. But Robert Rowlands was a persevering soul. He dutifully dug out his tape recorder, slapped a blank cassette into the slot, and spent the rest of the night recording the increasingly heated conversation taking place between the lookout and the gang. The lookout may have only had one job, but it's clear from the tape that he wasn't very good at it and he just wanted to go home. After a while, he starts moaning to the others, how long do you think you're gonna be in there? My eyes are so bad. They're blurred. I've been using bins all night. <laughs> Wait, is it? I mean, he's taking a shit in a bin. <laughs> oh, I consulted with Dick Van Dyke and it turns out that bins is a cockney slang for spectacles or binoculars. Oh, okay, that makes more sense. I was like, wait, he's just there for one evening. Does he really need to have a shit that bad? Dude, you, you're robbing millions of pounds. Just shut the fuck up and do the lookout job, <laughs> you whiny bastards. <laughs> One of the tunnelers suggested that the lookout should be able to get some sleep soon, until somebody else interjects to point out that a sleeping lookout isn't going to be particularly helpful during a bank heist. Several other agitated voices joined in the conversation, including the voice of a woman who was never traced. One of the tunnelers attempts to boost the motivations of the lookout. You can go now. We're almost there. We've done 90% of the easy ones, and now face the hard ones. We've got about £400,000. It's not a bad rate of pay, is it? But the lookout was having none of it. Money may be your god, but it's not mine, and I'm off. Wait, you're involved in a bank robbery. Like, what motive, what possible motivation do you have to be there other than money? It's not you know, I like being a lookout. You obviously don't. What's your motivation? <laughs> it seems the lookout was ultimately dissuaded from off and carried on working and whinging throughout the entire night. But Robert Rowlands figured that he must now surely have enough evidence to present to the police and hopefully help foil a major burglary. He decided against phoning the local police station again, as he assumed it'd probably just be interrupting their darts tournament or something. This time, he went straight to Scotland Yard. I don't really know. Scotland Yard's like the big police. That's where they solve the major crimes. And I guess it's like FBI equivalent? I'm not sure. I, uh, the only thing I really know about Scotland Yard, which is quite bad, I guess, is that they have this big rotating cube outside their headquarters with their name on it. Because when I was a kid, that's, you know, they'd be like, and this statement from Scotland Yard, and it would just be this thing that's in a big rotating cube that said Scotland Yard to show that they were at Scotland Yard or whatever. <laughs> 
just have a picture of it. I'm not sure why. Why this is important, it's not. The police now quickly limped into action, but after arriving at the home of Robert Rowlands and listening to the taped evidence, they made a curious decision. It seemed clear from the tape that the gang were attempting to tunnel underneath an as yet unidentified bank vault to crack into the safety deposit boxes. The frequency range of walkie talkies was very short back in 1971, particularly in built up areas with houses and shops and walls and wimpy bars. Wimpy bars is like a fairly. It's just not very good burger restaurants back in the day. I don't think they exist anymore. I remember the one being on a high street in the town I used to live near. It always looked a little bit grotty. It was kind of like grotty McDonald's. And that's saying something, isn't it? Like, McDonald's is, is quite nice these days. I feel it's not grotty anymore. But when I was a kid, McDonald's was pretty grotty. And Wimpy Bars was like a grotty McDonald's. Oh. Robert made a point of informing the police that the bank under siege couldn't be any further than just a mile or two from his home, and this must surely have narrowed down the potential targets quite a bit. However, the police chose to completely ignore this information and opted instead to investigate every single bank within a 10-mile radius. This was a total of 750 banks to check on. Naturally, they were all closed during the very early hours of a Sunday morning, so the police had to contact the managers and security teams of every single branch and get them out of bed to open up the bank so that the police could take a good nosy around. This ridiculously wide search obviously included the Baker Street branch of Lloyd's, but it was destined to be a brief visit. Ha. Ha. Huh? What? I don't understand how they could possibly not do their job. This, how can they do their job this badly? You don't check in the vaults, maybe? <laughs> like, what? After all, the police had 749 other branches to investigate, so they couldn't hang around long. I'm just saying stick your head in the vault and see if there's anyone in there. <laughs> Be like, hello? What's going on here, then? They quickly determined that the time-locked vault hadn't been tampered with in any way, and there was no visible sign of a break-in, so they just ticked the box and moved on to the next bank. Guys, how? You know they were tunneling. You know they were tunneling! What do you think they were tunneling in through the main door? <laughs> what the f This blunder of blunders gave the gang the rest of the weekend to leisurely crack open a reported total of 268 safety deposit boxes and carry all the contents back through the tunnel and up to the shop before eventually making their escape with the treasures well before opening time on Monday morning. And the lookout finally got to go home and rest his tired eyes considerably richer than he was at the start of the weekend. Well, he doesn't care. Money's not his god. <laughs> He's just in it for the thrill. We can't put an exact figure on the total value of the looted safety deposit boxes, largely because even the bank itself didn't attach a specific value to every box, and some of the box owners never even came forward to reveal the contents or claim compensation. Yeah. They don't know what's in those boxes, they're private boxes. The most conservative estimates bandied around was the region just under £2 million in today's money, but it's widely suspected that the true figure was closer to a value of £36 million in today's money. And the overwhelming majority of the loot was never found. It wasn't until Lloyd's opened for business again on Monday morning that the staff noticed a minor problem when one of them wandered into the bank vault. The scene was littered with smashed up deposit boxes, walkie talkies, a thermal lance, not to mention the slightly suspicious big hole in the floor. And there was a taunting message spray painted on one of the walls which read, Let's see how Sherlock Holmes solves this one. Maybe this really had been about Tony Gavin's peculiar obsession with Sherlock Holmes this whole time, and he certainly seemed to have been right in the assumption that without a final heroic fictional detective on the case, the gang of thieves, now dubbed the Millionaire Moles, were bound to get away with one of the cheekiest burglaries in history. While the fact that we know his name is Tony Gavin and not Mystery Robber Number One is implying me that old Sherlock's gonna get on this case. You would have thought that the British press would have a field day with this crazy yet the reporting was strangely subdued. A brief news blackout was sensibly imposed by the police during the actual weekend of the burglary to avoid the gang getting wind that the Keystone cops were on the case, but the cat was out of the bag by Monday morning, long after the gang had scarpered. But after just a few days of front page headlines and fierce press criticism of the seemingly inept police, everything just fell strangely quiet again. This was highly unusual as big stories like this had a potential to run for months and months, but the Baker Street robbery appeared to have been discreetly brushed under the carpet surprisingly quickly, almost as if it had never happened at all. It was also it was alleged that the British government had hastily issued a D notice to silent the pre silence the press for some reason. A D notice or defence notice is not a legal demand, but a formal request made by the government which asked the press to cease reporting on a story that could be considered a threat to national security. But how exactly could this slightly bumbling bank job be con considered a threat to national security in any way? And could it have been something to do with the contents of one of those deposit boxes in particular? Perhaps the only box that the gang had ever been interested in cracking open in the first place. Ooh, so now we get to the mystery part about that royal family photo right 
What could it possibly be? I have no, I, I genuinely don't know. I've never heard of this case before, which apparently is strange because it seemed to be quite a big deal back in the day. The subsequent in investigation by police was supposedly a highly complex affair which involved 120 detectives, none of them called Sherlock, and <laughs> no one's called Sherlock, and the forensic examination of over 800 pieces of evidence. Yet on the face of it, they didn't really have to try all too hard to catch key members of the gang during an investigation in which some of the suspects were practically crying out to be arrested. All they really had to do was have a word in the ear of Benjamin Wolfe, the guy who bought the lease on the old leather goods shop who had quite staggeringly decided to use his real name when he signed the contract. <laughs> what? <laughs> Surely, I mean, I get it. Maybe he'd just be like, well, they broke in. You know, they definitely broke in. Where'd you get that new car? Dunno. <laughs> You would never have caught Professor James Moriarty making such a fundamentally foolish error, and you certainly didn't need to be Sherlock Holmes to crack the case. Whilst Benjamin Wolfe initially denied any involvement in the burglary, the police just followed him around for a little while, during which time they observed him exchanging big carrier bags of cash with certain other shifty individuals who were also placed rapidly under surveillance. <laughs> Guys, if you do like some robbery like this, surely you have to go to ground for like a good couple of years. You've just got to accept you're not going to be able to spend any of that money for a long time, and you might have to leave the country and move to Lebanon. Like, you can't, you can't just be like carrying around bags of money when you're tied to a crime. The police will be watching, and they'll be using that to build a case against you and all your contemporaries. What are you doing? Conspirators. It didn't take long for the police to join the dots on this one, eventually arresting Benjamin Wolfe himself along with supposed ringleader Tony Gavin, bank vault mapper Reg Tucker, and the tools guy Thomas Stevens. Although the police knew for sure that several other parties were involved, maybe even a shadowy mastermind who was really calling all the shots, nobody else was ever arrested or identified. It's almost reassuring to hear that at least the lookout managed to get away with his share of the treasure. It sounds like the poor lamb had endured such a tough weekend trying to keep his eyes open for all that time. Yeah, this guy's such a... I'd be really upset with it. I'm like, digging through a tunnel there's toxic fumes i'm breaking up in safety deposit boxes and it's like risky and there's just a dude sitting on the roof and he's always whining and it's like oh, shut the fuck up man i'm trying so hard right now and you're just sitting on a roof keep your eyes open the trial of the four of the less fortunate millionaire moles got underway on the 2nd of January 1973. All four were charged with breaking into a bank, stealing the contents of deposit boxes, and handling explosives. Tony Gammon, Reg Tucker, and Thomas Stevens all pleaded guilty, but Benjamin Wolfe was still insisting that he was an innocent victim who had just tried to open a new business venture which had been hijacked without his knowledge by moles. Sure, mate. And he's like, what are you doing with all those giant carrier bags? It's, like, it's just giant Tesco bags filled with cash. What are you doing? The trial lasted just 19 days, and all four were found guilty of all charges. Tony Gavin, Reg Tucker, Thomas Stevens were each sentenced to 12 years in prison, whereas Benjamin, despite pleading not guilty, received a lighter sentence of just eight years, because of, apparently because the 64-year-old was considered a bit too elderly to endure a long prison sentence. How about we don't make that a consideration? Like, the, what was it, the Lockerbie bomber? It's like, oh, he's got cancer, let's let him go home. It's like, f*** off, he killed hundreds of people. He's a f terrorist, let him die in prison like he deserves. What the f***? The sentences of the other three were also reduced to eight years on appeal. They could possibly all have received lighter, even lighter sentences if they had revealed all the identities of the other members of the gang or the location of the stolen loot, but they all kept shum. Then they continued to keep shum for the rest of their lives. After they had all served their time, they seemed to retreat back into the shadows and were never really seen or heard from again. Yeah, they moved abroad with some fat stacks of cash. Oh, is it hot in here? No book deals, no movie deals, not so much as a brief interview with the Jelly Deal local newspaper. They just seemed to vanish without a trace. Wherever they retreated to, it's possible that they finally ended up enjoying their share of the unrecovered booty that they'd been waiting eight years to claim, assuming the lookout hadn't already spent it all on luxurious goose feather billows. It might have been nice if amateur CB radio ham Robert Rowlands was given some sort of commendation for his sterling efforts in attempting to thwart the burglary, even if the police were initially disinterested in his claims and then bungled any chance of catching the criminals in the act. But no, instead, the police considered prosecuting Robert for listening to unlicensed transmissions, which was a violation of the relatively new 1967 Wireless Telegraphy Act. F*** you, police. What the f*** he did your job for you? And you're like, yeah, he's also a criminal. Eight years. It's almost as if somebody in the police force wanted to punish poor old Robert for his clumsy interference. Thankfully, this idea was quietly dropped. Good. And Lloyds Bank later showed a bit more appreciation for Robert's role in the saga when they gave him a reward of £2,500, which is like, what, doing that um, maths? It's like 25 grand today. That's pretty nice. Lloyds themselves hadn't done as badly from the burglary as you might imagine. Yeah, because they don't know what's in the boxes. 
that's people's own risk. And if they are insured, then Lloyd's isn't going to be the insurer. It's going to be an underwriter. The biggest hit they took was their reputation for owning the most secure vault in the UK. By 1977, 138 of the disgruntled owners of the 168 destroyed deposit boxes had joined forces to sue for a total of £660,000 or $3.6 million in today's money. However, just four days into the trial, the case was adjourned with no reason given and it was never picked up again. This just seems to be yet another mysterious development in a story packed full of riddles and unanswered questions. It had always felt odd that a bunch of small-time crooks, antiques dealers, and second-hand car salesmen had taken such an ambitious step into a whole new league. Could it be the case that this was never just a nutty plot dreamed up entirely by Sherlock Holmes fan Tony Gavin, and that Tony was answering to a higher and more experienced authority who was more equipped to fund the entire operation and who had a bigger idea of how to disable complex security devices and where to source a thermal lance? Why well, didn't just go to AliExpress? <laughs> Yeah, I bet if you search AliExpress right now, someone's going to be selling double lots. They sell everything there. Trust me. Why did the police make the bizarre decision to expand the search radius to 10 miles when they already knew that the maximum range of those walkie-talkies was just 2 miles? And why did the police leave the Baker Street branch of Lloyd so quickly after ascertaining, ascertaining that the vault door looked like it hadn't been tampered with? They already knew from Robert Rowland's taped walkie-talkie conversations that the gang were tunneling right underneath the vault rather than just attempting to break the door open with a hammer. Yes, this is insane. It's like, you know they're tunneling, Belize. You don't need to, oh yeah, front door's good. It's like, that's not how they're getting in. Obviously, we, you know this. That's why you're searching. It's very suspicious. I'm always like, generally, if there's a conspiracy, I always just fall on the side of people are just dumb. Like, it's just people being dumb rather than actually conspiratorial. But in this case, this is really extraordinarily stupid, isn't it? You are made of stupid. All they had to do was open the vault door and look for any subtle signs of a giant fucking hole in the floor, but they decided not to bother. The post office later noted that the police could have asked them for help at any time as they operated fleets of radio detector vans, which could have picked up the location of the walkie-talkie conversations fairly quickly. Wait, why does the police post office have radio detector vans? <laughs> what are they doing with those? Post office, what are you up to? But they didn't hear anything about it until after the transitions had stopped. Why did the police lose interest so quickly in identifying the other members of the gang? Why were the press silenced by an alleged D-notice on the grounds of a threat to national security? And why are some 800 pages of information relating to the case under embargo at the National Archives where they remain sealed until 2071? Good lord. And could it be that the Baker Street robbery was about something potentially far more important than the valuables and secretive few million pounds worth of shiny little trinkets? One theory is that the gang unwittingly stumbled upon something inside one of the deposit boxes which they never intended or wanted to see. Photographs depicting an unnamed conservative cabinet minister sexually abusing young children. Duff. It's a theory which gains more traction four decades later following the Hatton Garden safe deposit burglary of 2015. This was a remarkably similar heist carried out by a bunch of six pensioners who spent a fun Easter weekend breaking into an underground safe deposit box in Hatton Garden, London and making off with jewellery worth around £14 million. Pounds. Have I never heard of this? In this case, all six men were caught and sentenced to prison, whilst most, if not all of them, if not all of the stolen loot was eventually recovered by the police. What are these pensioners up to? <laughs> It was a story which certainly garnered a lot more attention in the UK press than the forgotten Baker Street robbery. And in fact, local jewellers later reported a big boost in business thanks to all the publicity it generated. Some have suggested that the Hatton Garden heist was directly inspired by the Baker Street robbery, but it's also been alleged that the connection runs much deeper than that. One of the men convicted for the Hatton Garden heist, Brian Reader, was suspected of being one of the unidentified members of the millionaire Moles gang some 44 years earlier, although he always denied this and was never charged. Yeah, it's a bit late, isn't it? Oh, I suppose he could have been charged back in the day. But in the aftermath of the Hatton Garden trial, an old friend of Brian Reader began blabbing to the press about what his mate and his gang had supposedly found by accident during the Baker Street robbery. He reckoned that the gang had cracked open one of the safety deposit boxes and came across sickening photographs of a top Tory politician molesting young children. He told the press it was a shock for them when they found the photographs of a famous politician abusing children. The gang were disgusted and left them lying on the floor of the vault for the police to find, but nothing was ever done. Why exactly such photographs would be located inside a bank vault is up for debate, but the theory goes that they'd ended up in the hands of a blackmailer who was waiting patiently for his payday. It could have been the case that when British intelligence 
discovered such photographs were now scattered around the floor of a bank vault, they sprang into action to clamp down on any further press coverage, which could have exposed a P-word ring at the very heart of Westminster and potentially toppled the UK government. I feel that British intelligence would be, maybe I just give them too much credit, but I'm like, isn't that what the police are for? It's like why you have these separations of powers. It's like if if the prime minister commits crimes, it's like they're like, well, okay, look, you gotta like with Boris Johnson his stupid COVID parties and stuff. It's like, yeah, he had to face consequences for that because he's a citizen and like uh, just he's subject to the same laws. It's why we have separation of powers. And I like to think that if MI5 or whatever uncovered all, <laughs> be like we're blowing the doors open on this one, boys. This is what we're for. <laughs> Gonna change. Don't let me down, MI5. Please. It's an interesting conspiracy theory, and I'm fascinated by the idea that the same man could have been involved in two distinctive underground heists separated by 44 years, but we can't really give it too much credence as the story hinges on a single unnamed source who seemed keen to tell the newspapers that he used to hang around with some proper villains back in the good old days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or for all my pontificating, I don't believe this. I don't think this is true because it's just one dude who's telling a story, isn't it? However, a far more popular and widespread theory is that one of the deposit boxes contains somewhat compromising pictures of a senior member of the royal family, and that is what the gang had been chasing all along. Prince Harry was by no means the first to rock the royal boat, and it could be argued that in many ways Princess Margaret was just as much a spare several decades earlier. Admittedly, she didn't go quite so far as to write a warts and all book or give interviews to Oprah Winfrey, but the younger sister of Queen Elizabeth II still have a few reasons to feel aggravated after Big Sis ascended to the throne and bathed in all the glory, whilst her own duties within the royal family were gradually diminished, diminished as she slipped, slipped even further down the line of succession to the throne. Yeah, it's got to be pretty miserable, hasn't it? <laughs> Although, I mean, stop complaining. You're gonna, you, you've got, you're rich. You've had everything handed to you. It's like, oh no, you don't get to be queen. You probably have a way nicer life not being queen, to be honest. You're just rich and chill. Princess Margaret was also a bit of a wild party animal by all accounts, but just how wild did these parties get? See, this sounds a lot more fun than being queen, doesn't it? Could it be true that she popped up in a series of sexually explicit photographs in which she seemed to be enjoying intimate moments with a convicted criminal and other parties? Perhaps all at the same time? Oh, scandalous! Princess Margaret had originally hoped to marry RAF officer Peter Townsend in the 1950s, but as Townsend was a divorced man, this idea didn't go very down very well, with members of the government in certain corners of the press a big chunk of the public and the Archbishop of Canterbury who point blank refused to countenance a marriage to a divorced man. <laughs> Alright, chill out guys. Chill, chill, chill. Margaret later gave the impression that the idea of marrying Peter Townsend had been made impossible by all concerned, but that doesn't sound quite like the whole story. It's now believed that older sister Liz was sympathetic to her plight and was planning to request that the government amend the hideously outdated laws which were standing in the way. That sounds like a great idea. Why? They, the problem is, if those laws were so hideously outdated, Dated. Why is the press, the public, and I mean the Archbishop of Canterbury is obviously against it because he's like a religious douche. <laughs> it's a bit harsh, but it's like, <laughs> you shall not marry a man who is once divorced. <laughs> it's like, all right, chill, look, we all make mistakes, okay? <laughs> Why are you being like this, Archie? But it seems that the relentless and protracted stain of the controversy led to Margaret and Townsend conceding defeat and parting ways. A disgruntled Princess Margaret later married photographer Anthony Armstrong Jones in 1960, but it was destined to be an unhappy marriage with both parties indulging in long lists of extramarital affairs whilst alleviating the strain with cocktails of booze and pills. Oh, that's like cocktails of booze, and I'm like, yeah, obviously. Oh, and pills, I see, you're mixing them together. That sounds safe. That never kills any celebrities ever. Absolutely. Things had gotten so bad that Anthony had resorted to writing little notes labelled Things I Hate About You and leaving them sandwiched in the middle of whatever book his wife was reading at the time as an un unexpected plot twist. Wow, Anthony. <laughs> That's a pretty toxic relationship, isn't it, Anthony? <laughs> you by the time we get to 1971 Baker Street robbery, the couple had been practically living separate lives for years, although the divorce wasn't finalized until 1978. Margaret regularly popped up in the newspapers whenever she was snapped, attending yet another lavish party with yet another guy, and much of the publicity was negative. One tabloid described her as spoilt and ill-mannered. Over the years, she had drunk enough whiskey to open a distillery, whilst even some Labour MPs described her as a raw parasite and a floozy. It's little wonder that Margaret had taken to escaping the UK to spend some quality time on the Caribbean islands of Mystique, which had effectively become her second home by the early 1970s. <laughs> Life's so hard for you, Margaret. Boo hoo! What do you. I have to live on the Caribbean island of Mystique. <laughs> I live in a lavish palace. <laughs> 
She seemed to be spending a lot of time with a landscape gardener by the name of Roddy Llewellyn, who was 17 years younger than her, with my young boyfriend, Roddy. <laughs> Oh, I use his Roddy. Oh, <laughs> darling. And whenever the press managed to get a sneaky snapshot of Margaret and Roddy together, it was usually accompanied by malicious copy which portrayed Margaret as a predatory older woman taking advantage of a toy boy lover. You know, sometimes I think being a member of the royal family isn't quite all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'd, ra I'd just rather be like... I the nice thing is, you're rich. The bad thing is, the press are interested in what you're up to. I think this is like the same with celebrities. It's like the good news is you're rich. The bad news is that everyone's interested in what you're up to. <laughs> so you always gotta be thinking about it. But during one of the many visits to Mustique, Princess Margaret was also snapped alongside John Binden, an occasional actor and former gangster who had connections with the Cray twins and who was once believed to be running protection rackets in West London. I told this story before, but my, my nan used to live, uh, was neighbors with one of the XYs of one of the Crays. <laughs> it's fairly intense. I didn't really realize what that meant or like how like not significance but like who the i didn't really know who the craze were and then he grew up and he's like oh my god they're very famous criminals man <laughs> what's up although he had apparently turned his back on crime during the period when he was posing with princess margaret on mystique he did find himself back in the dock later in 1978 when he was accused of murder of the murder of london gangster john dark who was stabbed nine times during a fight with John Binden. However, Binden was acquitted of the murder when it was ruled that he acted in self-defense. Still, considering that the Archbishop of Canterbury couldn't quite get along with the idea of a princess marrying a divorced RAF officer, oh, the scandal, he must have been coming out in boils at the prospect of a still, married legal, uh, still legally married princess getting cozy with the former gangster. Perhaps the Archbishop of Canterbury would have been a bit more impressed if it had ever been given the opportunity to see John Binden's notorious party trick, or maybe not. Wait, what is this? This apparently involves John lifting five half pint glasses with his penis, the trick which he is alleged to have shown off in the presence of an enthralled Princess Margaret. Five half Jesus Christ, man. And how do you balance them on there? And yes, I know what you're thinking. Only half pint glasses? What a bloody ace. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> bloody amateur, only half pints. <laughs> I do it with those German ones, those, uh, the, the, the ones that hold like a liter of beer. <laughs> John Binzen would later boast about his close friendship with Princess Margaret to the media, but Margaret herself never spoke about any such thing. And the only evidence we have that they even met is a single photograph taken on Mysti Mystique, which later circulated to the media. But there were rumours that this wasn't the only photograph ever taken of Princess Margaret and John Binzen. Oh no. It was alleged that images of a far more explicit nature depicted Margaret, John Binzen, and other individuals in engaging in sexual activity. I guess this was the 70s, so it's a lot more scandalous today, but if this came out today, I'd be like, yeah, okay. It's completely normal. No, people are gonna do what people are gonna do, aren't they? It's okay. It's okay. Like, it's it's gonna bring down the government? No, it's just it's slightly embarrassing for the people involved and their family. Slightly embarrassing. I guess it's much more embarrassing in the 1970s, but like, chill, people, chill. Daddy, chill. And one or more of these photographs had ended up in a safety deposit box in the vault of the Baker Street branch of Lloyd's Bank. A safety deposit box which belonged to an individual by the name of Michael X. A safety deposit box which others were now keen to get their hands on by any means necessary. Michael X, born Michael de Freitas, was a black revolutionary and civil rights activist from Trinidad and Tobago who moved to London and became a leading figure of the black power movement of the 1960s. John Lennon was one of his most ardent supporters, although not everyone was as big a fan as Michael X was also a former London gangster who would later be convicted of murder. <laughs> It's like, okay, good, he's a freedom fighter and he's like fighting for like the rights of the oppressed and also he's a murderer. Well, unfortunately, that cancels out a lot of the good shit he did, didn't, doesn't it? In 1969, Michael X became the self-appointed leader of a black power commune in North London, which was known as the Black House. Less than a year later, a businessman named Marvin Brown was enticed into the Black House, where he was attacked and forced to wear a slave collar around his neck as Michael X and others extorted money for him from him under the threat of further violence. Michael X was also arrested and charged with extortion, but John Lennon was such a big admirer that he paid Michael's bail. Jesus, John. This guy kidnapped someone and made him wear a slave collar. I'm not even sure what a slave collar is, but it's probably not nice. Very shortly afterwards, the Black House burned down under mysterious circumstances, and Michael X fled back to Trinidad and Tobago, where he got busy setting up another Black House. But he didn't seem to have much luck with these Black Houses. This one burned down under equally mysterious circumstances around a year later, and this time the bodies of two former members of the commune are found at the site, having been hacked to death and then buried in shallow graves. 
Michael X was found guilty of ordering the killings, and whilst John Lennon had been happy to dip into his expansive pockets yet again to hire a good lawyer. John Lennon, what are you up to? Imagine trying to do that with no possessions. It wasn't enough to save Michael X from getting hanged in 1975. So, if we rewind back just a few years to when Michael X was still in London, the theory goes that he had somehow acquired these explicit photographs of Princess Margaret, John Lyndon, and others, and alerted the authorities that he possessed them while secretly stashing the originals in the vaults of Lloyd's Bank. His plan was to use them as insurance to persuade Scotland Yard to turn a blind eye to any activities that he got up to in the name of activism, which may not be considered strictly legal by some of the more pedantic police officers. You know, stuff like torture, extortion, and murder. I have to say, though, Mr. X, it's not a bad plan, is it? <laughs> if you do have those things, that's quite clever. To be like, don't forget I got those photographs. <laughs> I mean, blackmailing Scotland Yard it feels like blackmailing the FBI, which is risky. But also, if you're up to other risky... Th if, if, that's, if that crime is lesser than the other crimes you're doing... Then, I mean, it's probably worth it, isn't it? Not advice. Not advice. This could explain why Michael X was allowed to flee to Trinidad and Tobago after being charged with extortion. Or perhaps Michael X was only charged with extortion in the first place after MI5 had already located and retrieved the photographs, eliminating any capacity for blackmail after Michael X had been arrested. MI5 would never have been entirely happy with the idea of Michael X having Scotland Yard on his pocket, so they finally figured out where he was stashing the photographs and then orchestrated the entire Baker Street robbery to make it look as if the contents of his box just went missing in a random burglary. They may have silenced the press with the D notice to avoid any further digging into the story and any risk of exposing both the embarrassing blackmail scheme and the embarrassing photographs themselves. It's, I mean, there's not a lot of evidence to back this up, but it is quite interesting speculation, isn't it? I, I honestly, like, so far I think, okay, people robbed a bank vault, my dudes, that's it, they robbed a bank vault. But why did the police and the press give up on it so quickly? Hmm. It's a theory which generated even more attention following the release of the 2008 movie The Bank Job, written by British comedy legends Dick Clements and Ian Lafrenet. La it's important to note that this was presented as a work of fiction, and the gang of robbers depicted on screen, some of which are portrayed by Saffron Burroughs and Jason Statham, are all given fresh identities. There's no denying that the plot is based very closely on this theory, as we witnessed a gang of robbers tunnelling under Baker Street branch of Lloyd's Bank under orders from MI5 to retrieve a safety deposit box belonging to Michael X, which contained sensitive photographs of a member of the royal family participating in a threesome in Mustique. This is like... <laughs> on the nose, isn't it? Whilst Princess Margaret is never named, the film certainly delivers enough clues. The writers have indicated that even though the film had to be presented as a fictionalized account of events, they weren't just making all of this up from scratch. The script was based on extensive conversations with an informer, later identified as a man by the name of George McKindo, who claimed to have learned all the juicy details of the true story behind the MI5 cover-up after preventing two of the original members of the millionaire moles who were never caught. One further interesting point here is that MI5's file on Michael X is locked away from public view until the year 2054. The former gangster may have had an extremely dodgy biography peppered with extortion and violence and murder, but what did he do that is still not fit for public consumption nearly 50 years after his death? His own widow later claimed that she knew absolutely nothing about a plot to blackmail MI5, but also conceded that this doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't true. So, can this theory be completely ruled out? And is this the real reason why? Why a bank robbery overseen by MI5 completely disappeared from the newspapers so quickly? Well, let's start with that D notice. Almost every article or feature on the Baker Street robbery states it is a fact that the D notice was issued to the press just a few days after the flurry of initial headlines. As recently as February 2023, the History Channel looked back on the robbery for an episode of Piers Brosnan's Greatest Heists, which, by the way, Sounds like something of a fall from grace for the former James Bond. Wait, Piers Brosnan's presenting a show called Greatest Heists on the History Channel in 2023? I feel like I need to see that, and that's the first time I've ever said anything about the History Channel. During this episode, it was yet again stated that the press most definitely fell silent in response to a D-notice. But the truth is, there's not a scrap of evidence to suggest that the D-notice was ever issued at all. Oh, Piers, you let us down! Come on, Piers! I expect better from you! As I'm sure Simon may have already mentioned by now, it's peculiar for such a prestigious and respected platform as the History Channel to get something so wrong. Yeah, <laughs> shocking that the History Channel states something is fact in history that is not fact. It's just speculation on History Channel. Why, you, why do you do this, History Channel? I, I, I know why you do it. Money. The answer is money, History Channel, of course, allegedly, in my opinion. It all largely seems to stem from a later claim by CB Radio Ham 
raid Robert Rowlands that shortly after he alerted Scotland Yard to the walkie-talkie conversations he was picking up, his equipment was seized and he was aggressively warned not to speak to the media as a D-notice was already in place. It could be the case that Robert was either mistaken or was concocting fancy tales to inflate his role in a conspiracy theory and impress readers of his later interviews. But it's not out of the question that he was just being lied to by the police, or at least that a misinformed officer had given him the wrong details. I mean, the police had hardly treated Robert Rowlands with much respect at any age, at any stage, and this was probably around the same time that they were considering prosecuting him for picking up unlicensed transmissions. I'm surprised they didn't just beat him to death on the spot with a truncheon. Yeah, poor Robert Rowlands. Although he made out in the end okay with like 25 grand in modern money, right? It's certainly true that there was a very brief press embargo whilst the burglary was still believed to be taking place, and this was for perfectly logical reasons. But this brief press blackout appears to have gotten mashed up with an inaccurate claim by Robert Rowlands, which then evolved into widespread reporting of a D-notice that was almost certainly never issued. It seems it kind of seems a bit pointless anyway to issue a D-notice after the press had already been allowed to report on the story for a few days. And whilst it seems odd that the story just seemed to quickly fall off the radar soon afterwards, it didn't completely disappear from the pages of the press. The Times was one paper which continued to follow up on the story for a few months afterwards, although after those four members of the gang were swiftly arrested, there was rarely any particularly exciting new development to report on anyway. Well, that seems like the re real reason why it fell out of the press, doesn't it? Because it's like, okay, yeah, there was a few days, and then it's like, well, people are bored of this. Like, you can only milk a story for so long, and if there are no new developments, there's no new developments. It just seems... The reason is, people don't want to read it. They had to move on to other stories. There was probably all sorts of other going on. It could be the case that MI5 had nothing to cover up with a D-notice in the first place. It seems a little far-fetched to think that the intelligence agency would have chosen to orchestrate a covert operation in such a haphazard manner. Yeah, they're MI5. They do it properly. It was about, oh, what are we doing? We're breaking it. We're, we're digging up from an old leather shop. Leather bags, goods, or whatever it was. And we're gonna go into, we're gonna hire a bunch of, like, used car salesmen to break into there and steal these super important photographs. No. No, 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 no. Let's just say they had indeed located the whereabouts of a deposit box in a bank which they needed to discreetly acquire for whatever reason. Would MI5 really have concluded that the best possible strategy was to hire a group of small-time crooks and second-hand car salesmen to carry out the operation on their behalf? Yes, Danny and I, same page. A strategy that included getting the gang to use walkie-talkies, which could easily be intercepted by any CB enthusiast who was just trying to tune into Radio Luxembourg. And a gang that included a man who signed the lease for the vital nearby premises under his own name and a lookout who clearly wasn't very good at handling the pressure of looking out. It's not entirely inconceivable that the gang were set up and caught later on, or they perhaps even agreed beforehand to do the time before getting a payout when they were released from prison. But I wouldn't really fancy an eight-year stint in prison for the sake of a few million quid. Besides, the taped conversations of the burglary taking place seemed to point to a gang who were very keen to not get caught at all, rather than a gang who were preparing to fight over who gets top bunk in Wormwood Scrubs. And it just seems unlikely that MI5 wouldn't have adopted a slightly more subtle method to retrieve a deposit box from a bank vault without attracting quite so much of a long-winded drama. They're MI5. They probably could have just asked Lloyds Bank to open the damn box. But yeah, they're MI5. Just find someone in the bank who you can blackmail. Just MI5, just go digging through like their their past or whatever. And just anyone at Lloyd's. Like, just go to Lloyd's. Just any there's thousands of people who work there. Just find someone who's like secretly murdered someone. <laughs> And be like, MI5, we know that you murdered John. Now, we need you to go down to Lloyd's Bank, open up this box, and bring it to us. And then we'll destroy the evidence that you murdered John. It's like, okay! <laughs> right? That's what MI5 would do. They're a clandestine service. That's what they're good at. Not like hiring used car salesmen to tunnel under a building. Okay. But would there really have been anything salacious to find in a deposit box to begin with? And from where exactly did the Princess Margaret rumors spring? There's only about one. There's only one photograph containing both Princess Margaret and John Binton that we know about for sure. Taken in Mustique, it's a fairly incongruous image which shows Margaret and Binton sitting next to each other on deck chairs. Only one other person is visible, but there could have easily been a whole bunch of other people out of shot enjoying cocktails in the sun with them. The most controversial element of the image is that John Binton is wearing an Enjoy Coke cane t-shirt featuring a cheeky retooling of the coca-cola image there's absolutely nothing in the image that suggests that margaret and binden were either romantically linked or even particularly close friends it looks as if they just happened to be sitting next to each other during a lively gathering on a beach 
Leaving John Binden aside for just a moment, several different sources have claimed that other photographs from Mystique exist, which do indeed contain both Princess Margaret and nudity. But it's not the princess herself who is disrobed. The story goes that Margaret was hanging around on the beach with her alleged young lover, Roddy Llewellyn, and several other friends who all decided to take a spontaneous skinny dip in the ocean. All except Princess Margaret. She probably knew this wouldn't have been the best idea with so many gutter press photographers no doubt lurking in the palm trees. We don't know for certain if such photographs really exist, and of course, there would be nothing remotely wrong with them if they did. Yet, yes, it might have been viewed as slightly controversial if a senior royal had been snapped with their bits out in public, but I don't think it would have overthrown the British monarchy. And that was never implied anyway, as each account of the story insists that she kept her clothes on whilst her friends got on with whatever floated their boats. It sounds to me as if this was just another conflation of two entirely separate incidents to create something far more scandalous but entirely fictional. Princess Margaret just happened to have been snapped with former gangster John Binden on Mustique. Princess Margaret may have been photographed with other people in the nude on the same island. So this gradually evolves into Princess Margaret herself appearing nude in a series of photographs with John Binden, which then evolves into Princess Margaret and John Binden getting snapped whilst participating in a threesome. This is just nonsense. It's like, okay. <laughs> this is just made up. It's a bank robbery. The press went silent because no one's interested in the story after a few days because it's a bank robbery. Of course, even if such photographs had existed, it could be argued that whatever consensual activity Margaret got up to in her spare time is nobody else's business. But I suppose it's easy to see why Queen Elizabeth II might not have been mad keen on the idea of their publication, and why government agencies might have acted to suppress them if they ended up in the wrong sticky hands. I don't know. Is this really that? I guess it's the 1970s is a different time. But when I was a kid, there was a photo of Harry dressed as a Nazi, which is obviously worse than Harry naked. I feel like there's probably also pictures of Harry naked, to be honest. And it's like, no one cares that much. It's like, it's just, it's just, okay, well, that was a bit silly. That's not very clever, is it? And then that's it. It's just an interesting press story. It doesn't, I don't know, why am I defending the royal family? <laughs> I'm not, I'm like, I'm pretty Republican. But that seems to be a largely academic point, as, as such photographs were almost certainly not taken of such incidents that never happened. The most compelling evidence we have that the millionaire moles were never chasing one safety box in particular is those walkie-talkie conversations, which make several references to how much loot they're gradually uncovering, but not a single mention of any attempt or need to locate one specific box. The conspiracy theories relating to Princess Margaret and the involvement of Michael X were well and truly brought back into focus with the 2008 film The Bank Job. This 2008 film The Bank Job sounds exciting. I don't think I've seen it. But it was a work of fiction, albeit a work of fiction inspired by conversations with the informer George McIndo, who claim to have made friends with unnamed members of the gang. We only have George's word to go on here, and it's interesting to note that George's name is also listed in the film's credits as a producer of the film. It's almost as if he had just been purely interested in making a good movie all along. <laughs> Could that possibly be it? What? The movie's not real? It's based on a true story, but it's not... Or they say it's, you know, fictionalized or whatever. But it's like, it's just to sell tickets. It's just because it's a good story. I'm sure that MI5 do have a big file on Michael X, and there may be good reasons why it's locked away until 2015. The guy led a pretty colourful life, but aside from the word of a movie producer, there's nothing else which conclusively links Michael X to either Princess Margaret or the Baker Street robbery in general. It sounds more like somebody with a fairly creative mind considered who might have taken possession of a scandalous photograph to use as a blackmail tool against Scotland Yard, and then figured out the perfect candidate would be the guy who once made headlines for using extortion tactics. It's a great story, but it's not what happened, is it? I feel pretty convinced that Tony Gavin and his chums were never on a mission to steal a photograph that was never taken, and they were only ever interested in the general loot to be found in as many deposit boxes as they could smash open before the lookout fell asleep again. But that doesn't mean there wasn't something else very dodgy going on here. I mean, a bank heist is a pretty dodgy situation in itself, but we're left still with a few unanswered questions relating to who was really pulling the strings and the subsequent lame police investigation which appeared to leave so many loose ends. Well, and can't we just wrap that up to the police, uh, write that off to the piece being a little bit Because <laughs> they were like, the guy's like, there's a robbery in progress, and they're like, yeah, sure there is, mate. I've got lots of drunken people to deal with. It's Friday night, okay? Evening. And it's, it doesn't seem like they were particularly good at this crime-solving stuff. It's still something of a mystery as to why a total of 800 pages of information relating to the Baker Street robbery will not be available to view until 2071. That is interesting. What exactly is it that the UK government still doesn't want us to know about this group of burglars nicking some trinkets from a bank vault? It's probably boring. It's gonna like roll around to 2071. Maybe I'll even still be alive. Maybe not. How old will I be? 
probably be old, I'll be like late 80s. I can still be around. Um, it's gonna be boring. It's gonna be boring. I'm probably gonna be that age and think back on this time when I was young and not like on the door of death. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, life has seemed so short. Oh, I'll find this video and be like, oh, look at you, Fax Boy. <laughs> Back when you didn't have hair. <laughs> when you had barely any wrinkles. <laughs> when your glasses were not so thick. One theory that I find far more plausible than anything else we've covered so far is that there was indeed a Mr. Big who was the real mastermind and bankroller of the whole operation, and that Mr. Big was a corrupt, high-ranking police officer. Ooh, interesting. There have been several allegations over the years that the reason the loot was never recovered is because it was taken by the bent police officer who oversaw the job from behind the scenes and ensured that it could never be found. One name. Also, criminals can ensure that loot never gets found. They just have to be good at crime. One name that often gets thrown into any discussion of corrupt British police officers is the late Scotland Yard Detective Inspector Alec Iced. This is a bit weird, as he was never once found guilty of any offences and was acquitted during the only corruption charges he ever faced in 1977. In fact, he was awarded a whole clutch of medals and commendations during his high-flying career at Scotland Yard, although it's interesting to note that he quickly was quietly downgraded to monitoring traffic wardens during his final years in service. Maybe that's just because he wanted something a bit more chill. It sounds like this guy didn't do anything wrong and he got a bunch of commendations. But not everyone was in a rush to give Alec Iced another medal. The Guardian journalist Paul Lashmar observed that Iced was, by reputation, the most corrupt yard officer of the 1950s to mid-1970s, which was no small achievement in such a packed field. Holy s***, that is an accusation, The Guardian. It was alleged that he forged a close relationship with criminals, often getting them off the hook for, in return for bribes, and that he was a master at making crucial evidence disappear into thin air. Well, how about we go have a look at Alec's house? <laughs> like, just be like, where's Alec live? <laughs> and if he lives in a f mansion, you'll be like, Alec, how'd you get this mansion? And he'll be like, family money. And then have a look at his family and see if they're rich and be like, Alec. <laughs> Alec, 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 we need to have a word. <laughs> That's how. That's how. It's not that complicated, is it? Some former convicts have even claimed that Inspector Alec Iced actively participated in armed robberies, allowing his chosen gang of villains to get off scot-free in return for his share of the stolen loot. It's a name which understandably bubbles to the surface when discussing the possible identity of the real Mr. Big behind the robbery, as it does sound like a job that would have been right up his street. I'm obviously making no such allegations myself, certainly not, and I'm sure that Alec Iced was brilliant at monitoring traffic wardens, I hope he got a medal for that, but even if the Baker Street robbery in no way involved Alec Iced, it could still have potentially involved other police officers, and this would have made sense in so many ways. Over the years, several criminals have come forward to allege that members of the police force were heavily involved in the heist, and whilst you might be tempted to take the testimony of convicted criminals with several pinches of salt, one such allegation is particularly noteworthy. James Humphreys was a pornographer and a strip club owner from Soho who managed to forge a hugely successful career in the 60s and 70s by working jolly hard and bribing police officers whenever he needed a quick favor. Is it, like, was it really in the 60s and 70s you could bri bribe police officers? The idea of, like, bribing a police officer in the UK? Maybe I'm extremely ignorant, but it seems absurd to me. The idea that I could do some crime and then be like, afternoon officer, and then just slip him an envelope with like a grand inside or whatever, it just seems, that seems insane to me. Is that something that actually happens? People in the comments let me know. Surely police don't get bribed because that guy's got so much to lose. If he gets caught for bribery, he's going to lose his pension and all of that stuff. And policemen get to retire young. My uncle retired at like 55, I think. He was a detective. And it's like... That's a pretty good deal. You don't want to screw that up. Amongst many other things, Humphreys regularly paid police officers to repeatedly raid other sex shops while leaving his own shop well alone until his competitors eventually gave up and closed down their businesses. In 1977, Humphreys was sentenced to eight years in prison after being found guilty of inflicting grievous bodily harm on his wife's former lover. But he only ended up serving just over three years after reaching a deal in which he agreed to hand over his diaries, which contained extensive information on all the dodgy deals he'd cooked up with the corrupt police officers during his successful career. This lady's writing down his crimes there, isn't he? It works out for him. But not those police officers. This led to the arrest of an imprisonment of no less than 13 bent members of the obscene publications branch of the Metropolitan Police who had been accepting bribes from Humphreys for years. Oh, obscene publications branch. They're like making sure people aren't making porn. <laughs> No, the past. Whilst Humphreys was singing like a canary, he also made allegations that corrupt police officers had been in on the Baker Street robbery and ended up walking away with millions of pounds worth of unrecovered loot. Surely you got... <laughs> I don't understand how this works. It'll be like, look, police officers, if you live in a massive house and drive a fancy car, on like, I don't know how much police officers make, but it's not that much. So 
Sure, how do you spend this money? How do you enjoy this? Like, it, without people getting suspicious, it doesn't make sense. This particular allegation never led to any charges, but considering that so many of James Humphrey's other allegations have been bang on the money and led to the imprisonment of 13 police officers, you have to wonder if there may have been more than just a grain of truth in his claims. Incidentally, it's good to hear that James Humphreys got back on the straight and narrow following his early prison release, opening a greyhound breeding business in County Limerick in Ireland. Oh, what a nice end to the story. No, wait, scrap that. <laughs> okay, no worries. The Greyhound breeding business was just a front for an illegal amphetamine factory. Of course it was. Humphreys was later cheated out of his investment in a drug smuggling operation based in the US before he was sent to prison again for running three brothels in London. But the point is that if Humphreys' allegations were true, it would solve a few of the more curious elements of the inaccurately named Baker Street robbery. I'm not pointing the finger at anyone in particular, but if a Scotland Yard detective inspector with close connections to the criminal underbelly of London was pulling the strings all along, this could explain why an operation conducted by small fry crook crooks was so well funded and organized. It would explain why the Police had deliberately been sent on a wild goose chase spanning 10 miles after that meddlesome Robert Rowlands was ne uh, nearly wrecked the whole thing, and why the police officers checking in on the Baker Street branch didn't seem very interested in looking for the tunnelers that they were meant to be catching. Yeah, I'm kind of into this. I kind of like, yeah, look, I mean, police corruption was obviously happening because 13 bobbies went to prison. So I'm kind of into this. I'm kind of like, yeah, okay, someone was throwing some spanners in the works from the, in the police side of things. The media, the media lost interest because it wasn't interesting. The police lost interest because there was a spanner in the works. And the robbers were robbing because they like money. Boom. Cut. That's it. I think prima facie, that's the most obvious thing that's going on, right? It could explain why not much effort was invested in tracking down the other unidentified members of the gang, as the British police are notoriously slow when it comes to arresting themselves. It's not out of the question that Tony Gavin, Benjamin Wolfe, Reg Tucker, and Thomas Stevens all disappeared into complete obscurity after their release because the bent police officers had bought their complete silence with a particularly generous slice of the bounty which the police have been keeping warm through those long eight years. It may be a long time before we know for sure. But if you think we've got patience to hang on just a little while, please join us again on Decoding the Unknown in 48 years for our follow-up video in which we'll be opening those 800 pages of information still sealed in the National Archives. It's a really long time away. It's also a little bit depressing that I've only got 48 years before I'm really old. That doesn't seem that long. Ah! In the meantime, I just feel there might be something quite plausible about the idea of diverting attention away from a genuine conspiracy of police corruption and greed by turning it into an outlandish fake conspiracy theory involving royal family members and blackmail plots which everyone starts chasing instead. Is that remarkably cunning or alarmingly simple? It's elementary, my dear Whistler. Yeah, this was very enjoyable, Danny. It felt like a casual criminalist, but it definitely belongs on Decoding the Unknown with the mystery element, doesn't it? Love this. Well done. I hope you enjoyed it at home as well. If you enjoyed this show, please leave a review. If you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.